Hello there. Welcome to my debrief of episode three of The Vow Part Two or Season Two. Um, a quick piece of uh, housekeeping, two quick pieces of housekeeping. First, spoiler alert, if you have not seen this episode yet, please see the episode before you listen to me. I will ruin a bunch of things for you. And speaking of the way I just said ruin, there are some people on social media that are giving me shit about the way I mispronunciate words. That's a joke. Mispronounce words. Uh, I am from South Africa. I do speak funny. I do fuck up a lot of words. Uh, my wife, Bonnie, teases me about the way I say room, R-O-O-M, room, and ruin, ruin. I say ruin instead of ruin. I do that quite often. Um, I, yeah, being, being a foreigner, you know, and coming to America later in my life, I think I brought a bunch of bad habits with me or just habits. Look, to be honest, when I look at the profiles of the people giving me shit, they happen to be American. I'm not sure how much they've traveled, but I'm presently in Europe. Um, everybody mispronounces everything here. That's just the nature of you know, not having amazing command of a language. My father, in fact, who was born in Portugal, said to my mother and I once, um, he was describing people that didn't have common sense. And he said to us once, you know, they don't have Kanoe Hoey. And we're like, what the fuck did he just say? And we, we investigated more and we asked him to write it down and he wrote down know-how. But he couldn't say know-how. So he said Kanoe Hoey. So from that point on, uh, my mother and father and I said Kanoe Hoey, and now Bonnie and I say they don't have Kanoe Hoey. So it's a thing that happens, you know, when you speak multiple languages. So give me a break, guys. Oh, one other thing. If you want to get a sense of the way I spoke when I was little, the way my people spoke, go check out somebody called Sammy Hall Says. S-A-M-I Hall, H-A-L-L, -L, I think it is. Sammy Hall Says. Um, South African woman who... Um, is extremely fucking funny uh, on TikTok and Instagram. You'll get a sense of where I'm from. That's kind of the way I used to speak. So hence the reason I say ruin and rum and many other words that I fuck up. So this particular episode, um, this one really made me cry. I wept. I wept at a certain point in the middle of the episode and I wept at the end of the episode. And again, you know, my overwhelming feeling in, in watching this season, and especially this one, is just deep sadness. Uh, again, I'll try and go in order of the things that came to mind. Um, you know, when, when Nancy Salzman said that, that Keith Raniere was abusive, she began to come to that understanding. And that's kind of what I was trying to tell her, not kind of, that's what I was telling her in um, January 2016, is I began to notice the way he treated her. And I was telling her that, but she couldn't actually take it in, um, which I think is pretty common when you adore somebody that much, you can't actually see what's going on in front of you. So um, I, just you guys know, I have not spoken to, to Nancy Salzman since, since I left. Um, so there's a lot of information I, I, I have not had. I, I have heard that she's had a certain recognition of, of what happened. Um, how much of that recognition, I don't want to sort of give away because I think it's better to, to have everyone see this particular season. But it seems like she is getting an understanding that, that um, he was abusive. And if you, if you listen to my podcast, Letter to the Inside, I think it was episode three, um, or part three, I should say, part three of four. Um, that's when I address with her um, the way she shut down when he was around. And I said something about the, to the effect of that it was because she had to do it in order to not face the horror of what was actually going on. Because I do think that subconsciously she was feeling a lot of stuff that she just wasn't allowed to feel, which is pretty common when people are being abused. Um, so I just thought that was interesting as I was watching. Now, you know from, from the last episode how I feel, um, certainly how I felt about Nancy. Um, it's, I'm very conflicted in many ways, but it is interesting to see what I was trying to tell her when you read Letter to the Inside. So this thing she talks about state control, because this whole episode is uh, well has a lot to do with the Tourette study. 
And she talks about state control. And this is the thing that people, including myself, believed when we were um, you know, doing ESP is that we were actually resolving deep stimulus response chains or hooks inside of our nervous system and our brain. And I found, as I was leaving, that wasn't really the case. What, what a lot of it was was just state control, trying to control your state. Like the way you felt about certain things wasn't okay, so you had to change it. Um, and the whole idea of getting people to recognize you actually have a choice about the way you feel. Now, look, I can get on board with that to some degree. If, if, you're, if you bring to conscious awareness um, things that you're feeling and you are aware of it, you could perhaps change those things. But you have to understand that the entire advertising industry and psyops industry in terms of intelligence is operating under the premise that you, you can't really change these things um, or that we're unconscious of them. And so they use and abuse that understanding. You know, if you look at us as a, as a, a closed neural network of, of responses, if you press a certain button, a human being will usually have a certain kind of response. And advertising is working on the basis that they, they know that's true. So the whole idea to generalize and say you have choice about every single thing you feel is absolute fucking bullshit. Um, and certainly uh, military psyops knows that um, and the entire advertising industry knows that very, very well. People are malleable, very, very malleable. But what happens is that when you learn that you, you actually can change your emotions or control your emotions, you start to feel like shit that you're not. And that's a whole other thing which we'll get into um, as this episode unfolds. You have to understand as well, and, and, and I'm going to say a general thing about this episode. I love this episode so much because it helps to demonstrate in a very profound way the way you're hooked into good stuff. Uh, so many of the characters are just hooked into like good things that they got out of it or, or things they felt were good that they got out of it. And as early as when I think I was like, maybe 17 or 18, I was in, a, in, in the library at Wits University. 17? Yeah, I think it was, I, no, I was 18. I was in the library of Wits University um, at the, the bottom end of the campus, and I found a book in the psychology section uh, written by Wilhelm Reich. And in the book, he was talking about how if a person was massaged in a certain place, certain muscles they could have an emotional reaction and begin crying because it's as though the muscles were storing some emotional memory. And understand this was, you know, this was way back in 1983. So it, it blew my mind. I was 18. I was like, holy shit, this is incredible. So my obsession for much of my life has been to try to understand the mind-body connection. So you can see what was so incredibly intoxicating to me about going to ESP. I mean, some of the things you hear Nancy Salzman talk about it, some of it's kind of cool, and you think that's that's really cool shit. Now, where it leads, and there's some, a whole bunch of problems with what she was teaching and the way she was doing it, but on the surface, it was quite intoxicating. Um, one of the things that, that Keith Raniere always said, and then Nancy Salzman picked up on that, is he called us stimulus response machines. He said, basically, human beings are stimulus response machines, you know, and it's a very reductionist view of things, but that's the sort of premise that, that he was operating under and that she took on as well. We're all stimulus response machines and we just have to change the programming, do behavior modification. And, and look, a lot of what you see in, in what is called the Tourette study is just behavior modification. Um, Mark Elliott, man, I have so many feelings about Mark. Um, I want to just say this first. Mark Elliott is a really good man. He is a good man. Um, I can't say that of all the people still loyal to Keith Raniere, I think there's some of them that have some kind of empathy deficit, something going on. Um, they're, they're just stuck in their heads and they just feel very little. And certainly some of them, I'm not sure how much empathy they do feel. I think they have cognitive empathy. Mark Elliott is a deeply emotional man who I think got his emotions excavated uh, in this process that they did to him. 
So Mark is, you can see in this episode, he's so very, very grateful about what he believes happened to him. You know, he truly believes that he overcame Tourette's because of the work of Keith Raniere and Nancy Salzman. And so he has this gratitude that he feels completely enmeshed with um, maybe not Nancy so much now, but but enmeshed with Keith Raniere. Like, it's almost like everything good in his life and, and Keith Raniere are the same thing. Um, and that's deeply, deeply sad. And he can't see that Ranieri is not who he thinks Ranieri is. I think he needs, he needs Ranieri to be um, this great, incredible humanitarian scientist. But listen, there are scientists that do remarkable work, and they're, they're pieces of shit. I mean, Joseph Mengele, who did the experiments uh, in the Nazi camps, I mean, modern medicine... Uh, it can give thanks to a lot of the work he did, but the work he did was fucking horrible. And the man was a complete fucking psychopath. And that's the thing people seem to, to not understand. Just because you do something or just because somebody perceives somebody to do something that they think is genius doesn't mean the person's morally good. And that's certainly the case with Ranieri. The thing I love, I'm going to go back to what I was saying before. The thing I love about this episode is that you see... I hope you can see the veneer that was being sold. You can see what attracted people. Um, it really was intoxicating when you first went in because you thought these guys have figured out the mind-body connection in an extraordinary way. They figured out the human psychodynamic. And, and Nancy Salzman and Keith Raniere were talking about the human behavior equation. We're changing the human behavior equation. And that shit, for me, being a geek, was absolutely intoxicating. Um, at one point, Nancy Salzman says, I, she says, I disconnect stimulus response till there was control. And I thought, yeah, that's the problem right there. Till there was control. If you look at stimulus response, if you look at a Pavlovian link, and, and just to clarify, you know, a, a Pavlovian link is basically there's a stimulus, and every time you, you interact with that stimulus, you have a certain response. You know, maybe, you know, and the example she used of a certain tone. And every time you hear that tone, even though the event is long past, you still have that cringy reaction. Some people have it with colors. You know, you see a certain color. Something happened when you were a child. I don't know. You, you were very upset. You, maybe you were throwing up. You saw the color red. And then years later now, you see the color red, and you suddenly feel like you have stomach problems. You feel like you want to throw up. That's an example of a, of a stimulus response link or chain. Um, the belief was that those very deep primitive primal stimulus response links were broken. Now, it is possible that in certain cases with enough good awareness, they were broken. Um, but I'm beginning to understand more and more that most of what was going on was control. Um, breaking stimulus response was about reframing things and then controlling the response. What what Nancy believed she was doing, and I think sometimes was doing, is she believed that she was getting it to the point that there was no reaction at all anymore. Now, here's the problem. I think sometimes that was true, but I think it wasn't replaced with a healthy reaction. I think people's emotional reactions were dulled. And that's why DOS could, could eventually occur, because, you know, natural moral concerns or outrage were dulled and dulled and dulled until like really crazy shit was happening. And people were like, well, you know, what's the big deal? Why is that a problem? And they'd always ask, why is that a problem? Um, but control was a huge problem. And state control doesn't heal anything. State control is just that. It is control. Being able to change your state. You know, let's say you feel, you know, you're feeling a, a, a low state, for instance, you know, and you're supposed to go, this is the way we were taught, you're supposed to go in front of the class and you have to get your state up to be more high energy, so to speak. Now, what that resulted in is a tremendous amount of inauthent inauthenticity. My God, my, my mouth. Inauthenticity. And you can see that with people who suddenly are super hyper energized and everything, but they're not really authentic. They're not really there. That is an example of doing, a, doing state change. And it's interesting because I was aware, for instance, of 
in, in Scientology, there's a thing called the tone scale, you know, from, from a low emotional state that goes all the way to a very high emotional state. And I learned about the tone scale because I was doing a screenwriting course in LA years ago. And I guess the guy, the teacher was, was a Scientologist. And I remember saying at one point to, to Ranieri and Nancy Salzman, well, how is this different from Scientology, what we're doing? And Ranieri said, well, um, they just do state control, and what they do is they close off entry points. Because they're masking issues, you can't get back into the, the stimulus response entry point. Now, I thought what was so interesting is as I reevaluated years later, and even today I'm still you know, defragging stuff, I'm seeing that a lot of it was just state control. Um, and I think a lot of it was taken from Scientology, a great deal. With the Tourette study, where do I even start? I'm very familiar with the study, and I'm, and I'm very familiar with the, the film um, My Tourette's. I was the executive producer on that film. I brought the um, f- filmmakers in to, to, to work on it. Um, I actually removed my name in 2017 when I realized what was actually going on and what that film would be supporting, I removed my name. And I tried to, to reason with the, uh, some of the filmmakers and say this film should not see the light of day, this film should not get out in the world. And, and, and with some of them, it was very difficult. Um, and I used a metaphor, you know, because what happened was the, the filmmakers were incredibly proud of the film. And, 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 and you know, Mark Elliott was, was incredibly proud of, of what he believed was being done with Tourette's. And one of the um, metaphors that I used, you know, because I said, I think what's happened is, and this was to the, to, the, to the film team, I said, I think what's happened is that you've fallen in love with this creation, this, this film, and you're not seeing what this film does. Because what this film does is legitimizes a man who's plain fucking evil. And the metaphor I used was, was a movie that I loved and I've seen a number of times, is The Bridge Over the River Kwai. And in that film, I think it's Alec Guinness. I think Alec Guinness, so there's a bunch of British soldiers that are, t- that are, t- that are captured by the Japanese. And they're held in, a, in a, some kind of a camp. And, and they're tasked to build a bridge. And it just so happens that I think Alec Guinness is, um, his character, I should say, is an engineer. And so they have to build this bridge or they'll be killed. And so they start to build the bridge and they make this bridge. And he builds this magnificent bridge. And in the process of building this magnificent bridge, he loses sight of the fact that this bridge is going to be used by the Japanese to kill more British. And when, they're, when they go and set the charges to detonate it at a certain point, he runs to try to save the bridge because he's lost sight of, of, the, of, of everything that they're fighting for because he's so in love with the bridge. And this was the metaphor I used. I said, you know, being so in love with a film... Um, is, is, is great in isolation, but when you realize what that film is going to do, it's a huge problem. You cannot fall in love with a film that's going to support very bad things. And um, Bonnie and I actually went to one of, the, one of the festivals where the film was being played, and we were trying to, at first, get them not to screen the film, get the organizers not to screen the film. We tried to reason with everybody that was there. Um, they eventually um, called the organizers and had us kicked out. Um, and just, you know, I, I'd written to the organizers days before saying, you know, you cannot show that you cannot screen this film. It, what it supports is really, really bad. And that was pretty much the last time I saw Mark Elliott. And he was very, very angry at me at that point. Understandably uh, angry. Um, but yeah, that's, a, that's another story, which I will, t- I will tell more of at some point. There were a lot of things going on. The Tourette, the Tourette Project was one project. There was another project which has been called in the, in the media the Fright Experiments. The Fright Experiments were deeply concerning to me. Um, and I began to get an inkling of it because when I was working on this, this, this uh, Mexican film about kidnapping, I received a video from one of my subjects in Chihuahua, Mexico. And, and it was a video that he sent me um, and he said, it was a, a an execution video and he sent it to me saying, this is the shit we have to stop. And basically it was the cartels, um, had executed and uh, a number of people. And it was, it was terrible. It was, 
basically f- four women that had been, um, you know, stripped half naked and then a bunch of cartel members who on camera began executing them, you know, cutting their necks off and just hacking them to pieces. And it was the most terrible thing I'd ever seen. And I had a complete meltdown when I saw, when I saw the video and, and I understood why, you know, he sent it to me. Um, cause he said, this is what we have to stop. We have to stop this kind of violence. And I was messed up for days and Nancy Salzman noticed that I was messed up. And she said to me at a certain point, what's going on? I said, nothing because I didn't want to show this to anybody. It was too terrible. It was, it had really, it actually hurt my soul in a way it's, to this day still it's, it's hurt my soul. And eventually I told her that I'd seen this, this, this video and it just had really disturbed me. And she said, well, you should talk to Keith about it. And so I said, oh, I don't want him to see it. Now, at that time, I was making the assumption that he actually had, you know, he had feelings. Um, I said, no, it's too terrible. I can't, I can't let anybody see it. And so he called me, funnily enough, um, oh, no, no, what happened is he, he called me. I, I decided to share the film with him, and he says, I'll, I'll call you at some point. And so a number of days go by. I'm still very, very messed up. And he calls me on my birthday. I don't remember remember which birthday it was. And he begins discussing the video with me. And he talks about all the different perspectives in the video. You know, the young kid that can't quite, you know, cut the woman's head off. I mean, just vile discussion. And he's talking about it in a very, very cold way. And he's trying to get me to see all the different vantage points. And I'm just like, I think it was hyperventilating as as he's talking to me. So... That video, I thought that was the end of that video. I thought that was it. And then I heard that that video showed up in the fright experiments, that they were showing it to people. They had people, you know, hooked up to to, um, brain monitoring equipment, and they were showing the video to people. And, of course, it was, you know, people that had any conscience were just freaking out completely and having complete and utter meltdowns, you know. I think one person kind of had a nervous breakdown. And I was so horrified that that was happening. And I began questioning, why the hell are you showing this? So understand, there was a lot of freaky shit that was going on that, you know, was supposed to be science. I don't think, I don't think the fright experiments were science at all. I think he was looking for people that had a certain kind of pathology. Now, to go back to the Tourette's uh, study, what we're talking about is basically behavior modification. Um, there's a there's a, a a conversation that happened between Bonnie and Mark Elliott that I think is very very interesting. I'm just going to read my notes here. So when Bonnie knew she was leaving, there were only a few people that she risked having a conversation with um, that she cared enough about and thought they would be open enough to talk. And Mark Elliott was one of them. So. This would have been 2017, the beginning. So, so Bonnie told Mark that she'd realized that the entire system was based on guilt, coercion, fear, control, and abuse. And, and Mark began crying. And he told Bonnie that he, that he knew she was right and that the number of times that he'd been abused by Nancy and Claire specifically was, was a great deal. And also he communicated to her um, she tells me that he felt terrible that he'd allowed that kind of abuse to happen and hadn't said anything and hadn't stood up for himself in those situations, but he cried very, very deeply. So he was seeing some serious problems and Bonnie at that point felt that she'd somehow struck a chord with him, with Mark and that he was open to seeing the truth. Now, one of the things that that I th- that Bonnie was trying to also, well, I think one of the things that that Mark may have communicated to her is that this is according to her is that he had actually suppressed his Tourette's with control, and that he felt so controlled and so full of rage that he wanted to punch absolutely everything. That's what what he allegedly said to her. Um. So she felt like she was getting through to him. And that's what she began to realize too, that like this study didn't actually solve anything. It it was all about control. It was about controlling all the impulses. And it looks like Mark in that moment had that recognition. 
So then a few days later, you know, Bonnie at this point had resigned. And a few days later, Mark Elliott reaches back to her. Um, she actually showed me the conversation and, and Mark said, Hey, Bonnie, I was thinking a lot about our conversation the other day. And I'd like to share some thoughts if you're up for chatting again about it. I think it's important with respect to how I can help as a friend. That's very ESP talk. And so Bonnie replies, Hey, Mark, Actually, I don't want to talk about it anymore. I really care about you as a friend, and I'm open to staying in touch and talking about other stuff, but not ESP anymore. And he says to her in response, this is all in April 2017, um, Hey, Bonnie, I really want to share something about your process and my process as a friend. Really nothing to do with ESP and what's happened. Now, that I want to share something about your process meant feedback. And what we found out later um, from one of the other Tourette's participants is that Mark Elliott had gone to speak with Keith Ranieri, and I think Keith Ranieri had fucked him. And so now he was coming back to give Bonnie feedback on her process. And I think that was the point that Mark, how can I say it? He, he had a moment of recognition and then went back into denial. So, you know, Bonnie didn't respond to the message uh, because she understood the wording and, and she understood that that was, you know, ESP talk for wanting to give feedback and it meant that he wasn't actually waking up after all. And at that point, you know, so many people had tried to, you know, spy on us um, and get information and subtly threaten us that we just weren't going to communicate anymore. And as I said the last time, both of us saw Mark Elliott was at the, at the screening of um, a film festival in Vermont in, in the theater. So it is interesting, and I, and I believe that Mark would deny all of this. And again, this is what Bonnie reported to me, so I can't verify it. But I'm sure that he would probably deny all of this. Um, but I do think that there was a moment that he might have had a recognition that it was all control. And that's what it all was. It was all control. The moment when Isabella is, is on, you know, video conference with Mark Elliott to me is just, it's such an intense moment because I know what that's like. Um, and just so you understand, Isabella is, is the sweetest human being you'll ever meet. I mean, what an incredible soul. Um, and she's, you know, talking to Mark Elliott in that moment and she has so much fear because the people she's like Mark in that case is still loyal. And that's the fear we all had talking to people that are still loyal because every single thing you said was information that went back to them that ended up in that spreadsheet that Karen Antrina was talking about. But I can relate so much to that fear because all they want to do is head fuck you. And you can hear in her chat with, with Mark Elliott, he's basically just gaslighting her constantly. And her response is so beautiful because her response indicates morality. She's taking a position on morality. That's what's such a beautiful moment. And Mark is just so attached to his ideology at that point that he, I believe, can no longer see morality at all. And that's what happens in cults. Um, when Mark Elliott says, what if that's not true? Um, and she says, what if it is? It's, it's sort of an to a lot of us that, that were in this education, it's sort of an inside joke because it's called reality testing. Somebody says something and you say, what if that's not true? And the idea is you get them to reevaluate the statement they've just made that they so believe and, you, and it's a cue for, what if you just reversed your position? What if what you believe is not actually what's going on? And in this case, it's this codified gaslighting that he's doing. What if that's not true? And her response is so incredible and when she says, what if it is? And he can't take that in. So in that moment, he's trying to use the tech on her, but she has enough information about what's going on with DOS that she's not buying it. The other moment in that conversation that is so sad to me is when Mark Elliott starts guilt tripping Isabella as though like her leaving will be solely responsible for the destruction of this so-called Tourette study. And that's, that, happened, that happened to me with Nancy Salzman, you know, with a bunch of people where you make a choice against the narrative, against the party line, and that choice is going to destroy civilization. And that's what they did with a lot of people. 
And the, the, the level of guilt tripping and the fact that she doesn't buy into it is absolutely extraordinary. Um, because it's like what he's kind of saying is you're going you're, you're to hold back civilization kind of thing. You know, the civilization of like studying these things in science, you're holding it all back. It's, it's a very sad moment. And Ranieri did do that with people when they weren't on board with what he wanted. He did do that. Every time one of us spoke to somebody who was still on the inside, it was, um, it was like engaging in head fucking. You were just going to get head fucked. And the thing that was so sad is you, it's, it was like you were talking to a robot because you truly love the person that's being robotic. They're like AI and they're, they think they're doing a good thing, but all they're trying to do is head fuck you back into their position. And it's exhausting. There came a point that I wasn't so much afraid anymore of talking to those people, but it was just exhausting to keep hearing the same narrative again and again and again. You know, this like, this, 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 you know, intellectual mumbo jumbo that actually didn't make sense. It seemed to make sense to them, but it actually made no sense in reality. When Mark Elliott says, I'm curing Tourette's and I will never leave ESP, I, just watching that, I, I felt such sadness because, look, in film terms, you know, in, in terms of, you know, good drama, it is the most magnificent ethical moral dilemma. Because Mark believes that his life has been fundamentally changed because of them, he feels a level of loyalty. And, and as I said, he has Ranieri and that, what he thinks is that good thing that happened in his life conjoined completely so that they're the same thing. And, and it's so important because I really want people to understand that they leverage this thing you love or this thing that's important to you. And that's the thing you're attached to. But now because they supposedly helped you do it, you're hooked into them. They're the ones. You know, if we looked at religious terms, it's sort of like the person says, I know the, the, the doorway to the kingdom of God, and it's this door right here, and I'm in control of the door. And oh, or only I know how to go through that door. It's the same kind of shit, you know. But, it, but just to go back again, it's, it's, I really want people to understand Everybody who struggles to leave, who has a conscience, is struggling because they're holding on to, to their, their idea of goodness. They're not holding on to something they think is evil. They're holding on to something they think is good. And that's what makes it so very, very difficult to, to try to get them to let go when they have these, these things so conjoined. Another terrible moment was when Isabella expresses, you know, this, that giving into the body is weakness, and that is what we were taught, you know, that it's body versus the ideology, and the ideology should win, because if it doesn't win, you're a piece of shit. And so what happens is you're, you're more and more, you have this goal of where you should be, and you have this feeling of being a piece of shit because you're not there, and Bit by bit, what's happening is you're disconnecting from yourself more and more and more. And the way she feels eventually that if she has a tick, she'll be a terrible person. So what happens is you have to control it. Now, understand, when I talk about behavior modification, you don't need any fancy kind of, um, you know, psychology or, you know, NLP or shit like that to, to get a person to stop something. You can use, you can use some, some intense fear. I mean, if, if you... Let's say, you know, you're coughing and you cough a lot and I say you can control it and you say, I can't, it just happens. And I take a gun and I point it at your head and I say, if you cough one more time, I'm going to blow your brains out. You'll stop coughing. You can, you can use fear to make people stop doing things. That's, that's, kind of a, that's kind of behavior modification, but it doesn't solve the root issue. If it is a psychological issue that you're struggling with, it does not solve that issue at all. A lot of what the tech did was behavior modification and control not actually healing the root cause of anything. And the sad part was they said it was healing the root cause and it wasn't. Because when I came out of, out of ESP and the, the, the unbrainwashing began, all my psychological issues were there waiting for me. As, as you know, Rick Ross, the cult expert, said to me you know, in 2017, he said, you know, as you begin waking up more and making sense of things, all those issues will be there. The things you thought you resolved are waiting for you. 
you know, as you wake up. And that was true. That was absolutely true. It made me so fucking infuriated when um, Isabella talks about Nancy and, and Mark saying to her, why are you choosing to do this? I mean, that just really fucking drove me crazy because that's the shit that they did, you know, um, especially in that study. And when she says, when Isabella says, you know, I don't remember his voice over with her family, she says, okay, I stopped ticking but I became broken in other ways. And, and that, that whole conversation with the family is so sad and infuriating because the metric in that moment that Isabella's father is using is you stop ticking, that's the metric. Um, Isabella's you know, mother is, well, that's not the metric. Being a whole human being is the metric. And she, she really had been like in a war and she, she had severe PTSD. And so, that's what's so sad is if the metric is only you're not ticking, therefore everything is successful, that's, that's kind of fucked up. I mean, a metaphor I keep thinking about is, you know, if somebody goes off to war, let's say a soldier goes off to war, and before the soldier goes off to war, let's say this, this guy was very sloppy, never made his bed, had no discipline. He goes off to war for a couple of years, he comes back, and he's a shell of a human being because he's done terrible things, seen terrible things. And, but he makes his bed every day now, and he's extremely organized because it's, maybe it's the only way he can have control. And if you look at the metric of, well, he's organized and he makes his bed, that's good. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about, well, it's good because now he makes his bed and it's very neat. He's very organized. But this guy's broken. And maybe, the, as I said, the only reason he's doing these things is to have some modicum of control, but his soul has been excavated. And that's what a lot of these techniques were doing. They were excavating people's soul. I know that Mark probably believes, Mark Elliott probably believes that, you know, he has been healed. But what I see is I see a man that is so very, very controlled. Everything is very controlled. I see, you know, there's, there's no joy left at all. Um, I don't call that healing. I call that the equivalent of, well, now you make your bed and you're organized. But what happened to you, you know? So, I don't know, I think a war metaphor is a good thing to use. When Isabella starts talking about penance, man, that just gets to me. Penance was, an, was something that began getting introduced, um, I think it was 2013, maybe, maybe earlier. It was during the, the, the ethicist curriculum. You know, if you failed at something, then you did something more painful, and you did the more painful thing to ensure that you wouldn't fail at the thing again because you gave yourself a worse consequence. And planking, motherfucker, planking, or the amount of planking everybody did all the time. I mean, first it was a minute of planking, then it was two minutes of planking, then it was three minutes of planking, you know, anytime you fucked up. And I'll tell you where it really went weird for me, because, yeah, I was planking a lot, but when Ranieri introduced the idea that if somebody else fails, you take on the penance for them, and, and it's better if they don't know. And I was thinking, but, but, but why? Why does, is that some mystical bullshit? Um, but he was training everybody to feel that they were ultimately responsible, not only for themselves, but for everybody else as well. It's a bit like in the army, you know, if anybody in the platoon fucks up, everybody takes a punishment. That's what he was introducing. And that's in the last few years, that's the way everything was. There's a moment where Agnifilo says, you know, people didn't stay because they were coerced. Um, ah. Get rid. You know, people stay in very coercive situations. It's not like they go, "Oh, it's coercive. I'm going to leave." That's there are so many tendrils and and things holding them in place um, that many people stay in coercive situations. And so, if a person stays in a situation, that does not equal there is no coercion. Um, it could be they stay in a situation because it's not abusive and they like it, or it's abusive and they're used to it, and, and that's coercion. You know, now we're talking about coercion. When Moira talks about using legitimate psychological tools in a coercive way, and she says at one point, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy works on Tourette's as well, which I believe is true, um, that's the thing that sucks so much is, is legitimate tools were used, um, but they were used to entrap everybody. And because people often didn't have 
an experience of perhaps, you know, traditional psychology in another way or different kinds of courses. They just had this. They thought that this is the pinnacle of what's available in the world. And it's definitely not the pinnacle of what's available. Um, Tourette's was sort of going to be the golden goose for, for ESP Nixium because the, the whole Tourette study was going to be, this is the way Keith Raniere's image gets saved. This is the way people realize what a genius he is. Now, look, Nancy Salzman was doing a lot of the work. What Raniere did understand and does understand is he does understand behavior modification very, very well. But because I don't think there's very much inside of him, I don't think he really cares about what it does to a person. As I said, you can make somebody change their behavior, but excavate their soul. And that is, that is I want to say it again, that is what happened here. That is exactly what happened here. Isabella managed to retain her soul. Um, I think that a lot of the people that are still loyal, I'm not sure what's happened to them. I, and I don't think it's, I don't think it's healthy for them. I don't think it's good for them. There's a moment at the end of the episode where Nancy says, how could someone who created something so beautiful do something so terrible? And I think it's so very interesting because I think that at that point, Nancy doesn't know, maybe she still doesn't, I'm not sure how much she studied, but that is classic covert malignant narcissism where the person presents themselves a certain way and they've found some tools that they know will make people feel profound things, but they're a monster. Um, covert narcissism is far more dangerous than overt. You know, overt narcissism, so the, you know, the, the blowhard person who's full of themselves, that's very easy to spot. The covert, you know, or the, or the vulnerable or the humble narcissist, that is very hard to spot. And that hurts so much because they present themselves as somebody that's matching and mirroring all your desires, everything you want, they're giving it to you. And you feel this deep, intense bond with them because you feel like they, more than anybody else, get you. But they could be doing the entire thing just to entrap you, just to have control. Again, everything we were sold, we were sold what, what we thought was good stuff. It was amazing stuff, like the, the honey of life, you know, the, the honey of like changing the behavior equation to become like better entrepreneurs, better artists, better whatever it was. That's what we were being sold. Um, but there, were, there, was, there was a monstrous reason behind it all. Malignant narcissists that are love bombing you in, in the way that Ranieri did, they give you everything that you want. They match all of your desires and that's the thing you fall in love with. And then later, if you can't separate out that good stuff you felt or you believe happened with the monstrosity of what was actually going on, you, you, you're trapped. You're trapped in this thing that I think the people that are loyal to him are still trapped in. The, this, this thing where they give you everything you want, they give you sort of the equivalent of, of a perfect mother's love. Now, the, this thing I'm saying is not my idea. This is from one of my subjects that I interview in uh, our film, Empathy Not Included, that'll be coming out next year. A film about narcissism, malignant narcissism, you know, narcissistic abuse. And I'm not going to talk yet about who said that because, um, but basically I, I've interviewed, um, I think it's six now, self-aware malignant narcissists slash sociopaths, and they have given me incredible information um, and helped me really figure Ranieri out in many ways as well as, as a side thought. But one of them in particular talks about the kind of love that you get from a malignant narcissist, which is this perfect, amazing love. Sometimes it feels like the best, most intense, most beautiful thing you've ever experienced in your life. And you, you, you feel literally addicted to that, like you can never let it go. And they know what they're doing and they do it on purpose. And this is the thing I think that people are still trapped with. Um, some version of perfect love that they think is real, but it's not at all. What it is, is it's basically Ranieri who understands that, you know, he looks at people like stimulus response machines and he goes, okay, what button will make them feel awe? What button will make them feel the deepest love they've ever felt? And he's data mined all these years. So he knows what the buttons are. 
or he found out what the buttons are from other people. So when you meet him, he presses all those buttons and suddenly you're like, holy shit, this guy really, really gets me. And by the way, Nancy Salzman was also very, very good at that. Very good at knowing what the buttons are. I think that the moment that I truly wept was towards the end of the episode when um, Nancy talks about Lauren testifying, that, that she's going to have to testify, and it's going to be one of the hardest things she's ever done. I really wept there, because in that moment, I can imagine what it must be like for Lauren to go against Ranieri. Um, and she was probably still unraveling everything and figuring stuff out. But I really wept at that, at that moment. And, and partially, I think it's also because to some degree, I, I, I had a sense of what that was like, but also, you know, I've, I've, I've known Lauren Salzman for like 12 years. And, um, you know, we haven't spoken since 2017. So, um, and, I, and I know what she went through in the trial as well, which, which theoretically will be in the next episode. But that really, I just wept. I just totally wept uh, when I saw that. I just, I couldn't contain myself. I was so deeply sad for her. And again, for the entire situation, I mean, you have to understand, when I, when I look at the people that are still loyal, when I look at like people like Mark Elliott, I still care very, very deeply for him. And as I said, I don't think he's free at all. I think he's very, very trapped, believing that something profound has happened to him. And all that has happened is, according to him, he stopped the external action of ticking. But at what cost? That's not healing at all. That is absolute control and absolute behavior modification. So a couple of things that I think are worth mentioning. Um, I wrote a letter to the inside of Nixium in March 2018 that is up on my podcast. Um, part three of four is up at the moment. I think probably next week part four or four will come out. I think it's really worth reading. Um, it's it's a, a view into my mindset in March 2018, which was the same month that I went to Vermont to try to you know, get people to like, you know, wake up. I, I was deeply unsuccessful. Bonnie and I were completely unsuccessful and they all were just very, very mad at us. But we felt so desperate um, because by and large, many of these people are very, very good people. And the other thing that I keep on thinking about and I want to urge everybody, you know, when you, when you look at these kinds of cult stories like this or any other cult story, it's important not just to isolate this to like some wacky weird shit. This 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 process of what's happening in in this cult and when you see the way the inside is responding. This kind of abuse is the same pattern, you know, from from, you know, romantic abuse, you know, a cult of one to families to, you know, corporations to you know, churches to, you know, other cults and to ent entire countries. There are entire political parties that operate this way and people become extremely fixated on the leader because they think that their values, their deepest values and the values of the leader are the same and they're often not. Some politicians are selling you yourself. They're selling you what you want to hear and you fall in love with that, but they are not a representation of that. So I think it's really important to take lessons from these cult shows and, and expand it beyond just, oh, it's just some wacky cult somewhere. There are so many people that reach out to me and say, oh my God, I saw the vow and like I understood my relationship or I understood my family. Um, and that's really good. That's really, really good. I think that's really important. And I know I keep saying this, but I really am grateful for the messages we're getting. You know, I know, you know, I know, I know messages that Sarah and Nippy are getting. I know that messages that Bonnie and I are getting. It really is incredible. I mean, it's incredible what people are getting out of this. And I do know that some people are very upset about giving voice to the inside, but it's really imperative, I think, that people see the mindset of what's going on. And as I said, a good number of these people are not bad people. Mark Elliott is a good, good human being. And I, I look forward to the day that, you know, we could potentially resume our friendship. I don't know if we can. Um, maybe he's too upset at me. But I look forward to that possibility one day um, and to, to him being able to sort of defrag everything that's happened and we can actually talk about it one day. And I think it's, it's so hard to explain this, but 
every time I see an episode and I see my old friends, I have this, this weird feeling of like, oh, it's my familiar friend. And then I realize, no, 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 no. This is like, we're five years into not talking to each other, not being friends anymore. And, and I do have such sadness about that still, you know, I really feel sadness about that. Um, because by and large, every single person that joins a thing that turns out to be a cult is a really good person, a really good human being. Some of the most amazing people that exist are people that join these, these, you know, human potential groups or whatever they are that are looking for something and searching for something and searching is not bad and looking for something is not bad. So they are mag- by and large magnificent people. All right. This episode, as I said, very, very emotional. I mean, I just, I wept like a baby at the end of it uh, when we got back to the courthouse and, 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 and Lauren about, well, Lauren going on the stand, and she wept and wept and wept. So um, let's see what uh, the rest of the um, season brings. And as I've said before, please subscribe to my podcast on whatever platform you listen to it on, and we will talk soon.